Good afternoon, everybody. Th hi, hi. Thanks for coming. Um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, Care One Assisted Living Facility and Sharon, who provided the refreshments today. Very nice. That's nice of them. Yep. And um, they also brought some tote bags. If you want to grab one on the way out, you're welcome to. And now I would like to introduce our guests. We're doing something a little different today. Today we have Carolyn Shapiro from Real Pirate Salem Museum, and she's here to bring the museum experience to us. So welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. Now let's make sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All righty. Well, as I just was listening to all of you, you some of you have been to Salem, some of you have not been to Salem. Today we're going to bring a little bit of Salem to life for you, but really what we're going to do is bring Cape Cod and world history to light for you today. And I have a real honor to present this material to you. I should start first by giving you a little bit of background about the museum and myself. Uh, I'm actually a resident <laughs> right around the corner here. <laughs> and my dentist is here in Walpole on Main Street. <laughs> And uh, I definitely frequent Walpole with all restaurants, etc., which is wonderful for me. This is actually um, a, a sort of a phase two for me in my career um, as an organization. I worked for 31 years in financial services. I was at the American Express Company in New York, and I commuted from Massachusetts to New York on a regular basis just about every other day. But it was a very fulfilling experience, quite frankly. Um, I had such beautiful um, colleagues to work with. I learned so much about this world's most respected brand. And they really taught me a lot about how do you really reinvent things. My last stint at American Express was in the Traveler's Check division. Did anybody ever use American Express Traveler's yeah. Checks or even the gift checks years ago? Right? So the banks were getting out of paper, as you probably know, particularly starting across Europe. And American Express was sitting there thinking about, well, how do we reinvent traveler's checks? The company's 160 years old. We keep it going. And somehow in a little skunk works, we started this little change to recreate uh, plastic cards from paper. <laughs> how, how, why not, right? It's a card company ended up inventing the American Express gift card, which you probably see in all the malls here, the Simon malls like Braintree or North Shore, and you also see them all around the world, uh, now in differing forms. Some of them are co-branded, some of them are not. And that was a great experience as it relates to reinventing businesses, and that was my last stint before I retired. Now, I had the chance to go to Cape Cod. I have a place in Cape Cod, and I had a chance to take What did I do? Of course I had to jump something right away. I don't know why, but I couldn't rest. I met a guy named Barry Clifford. Does anybody know the name Barry Clifford? You've probably read about him in history and around Massachusetts for the last 30 or 40 years. Barry was a native of Cape Cod. He actually grew up in Hanson, Mass. He was a star athlete. And his family were all fishermen uh, out in Provincetown. He himself was a high-risk diver by trade. That's what he did. And he was always dreaming about something that his Uncle Bill used to tell him, <laughs> which they used to call Uncle Bill Uncle Bull, <laughs> so they really never knew if Uncle Bull was telling the right things. But regardless, 41 years later, after the discovery of the most amazing thing that you'll ever hear about today, and part of our own Massachusetts history, I met this person. And I had the chance to volunteer with him and his son Brandon and their team uh, on the dive operation in the museum, which is now his lab down on Cape Cod. If anyone's ever been to West Yarmouth, to the Widow Pirate Museum, that's Barry's personal lab. And I realized what a big obligation this was because they're not going to sell any of this thing that they're finding. And uh, this is the world's most fully authenticated pirate shipwreck that's ever been found. And it's right here off of the coast of Cape Cod. And think about the blessing that comes with that. You have the ability to see this history, but you also have the curse in some ways of, you know, diving on it, permitting it, uh, you know, sh uh, dive shops, uh, insurance, storage, all of this incredible expense that goes along with finding this wonderful treasure. So after 41 years, uh, myself and a few other people that feel strongly about this decided we wanted to help this out. And let's 
see if Barry and his son Brandon can see the fruits of their labor after 41 years. Barry's 78 now, and Brandon is about 42. And right now, we're starting to see real momentum on the shipwrecks recovery effort. I was just talking to a few people earlier to mention to you that what I'm going to show you today is actually on TV right now, to some extent. Um, the History Channel is presently airing three episodes on the show Beyond Oak Island. And if you've seen that show, Beyond Oak Island, you can actually go out to historychannel.com right now to check for the uh, season three episodes, I think 11, and then I think there's two more also streaming right now. And you will see what they did to come here to the Cape and actually share in the dive site with the guys. So you can actually go home tonight, and if you have nothing to do, go out onto your laptop and see if you can find these things, and you're going to actually hear a lot more about what it's like to actually sh uh, do some diving off the coast of Cape Cod here, which, as you can imagine, is so exciting with these beautiful 18-and-a-half-foot great white sharks that swim with you every day <laughs> while you're down there. <laughs> Not to mention the mungweed and the cold water currents. It's just a heck of a place to dive. So. Lots of kudos to the Cliffords who've really stuck it out all their years, fought the big fight, um, and I think they're really they're doing the right thing by history, and hopefully you guys are going to be ha uh, helping us to promote history here today. Uh, I'm going to give you a short presentation about what the museum is and a little bit about the story of what you see when you go into the museum, because it's a multi-layer story, quite frankly. It's not just about a shipwreck. It's about what was on the shipwreck, who was on the shipwreck, and why were they on the shipwreck or I should say the ship at that time. And then I'm going to actually take a Q&A as well, uh, which I think you'll have lots of great questions about. So let me just start first by telling you a little bit about Real Pirate Salem. Uh, back in April of 2022, in the pandemic, such a thrill, <laughs> we actually built this museum, which was a former warehouse on Derby Street in Salem. Um, if everybody's familiar with Salem, if you know where Essex Street is and the Peabody Essex Museum, the Hawthorne Hotel, the Salem Witch Museum, we're just a stone's throw from them right on the waterfront there. And a beautiful park called Charlotte Fortin Park, which is named after Salem State University's most famous alumni, actually, Charlotte Fortin. How ironic. She was a black woman, freed black woman, from Pennsylvania, whose parents sent her up to Salem to teach as a school teacher. And here we are with a, talking about a slave ship, actually, a, a, situated on a pirate's park, really, with Charlotte Fortin, who is now um, really a, a great uh, person to d demonstrate what it's like when you can actually become free. And so it's a, an honor to be situated on that particular location. Now, right now, we've been putting all kinds of effort into really moving this into the limelight, and I'm very proud to say that we have uh, well over a thousand five-star ratings on Google and also on TripAdvisor, on Yelp, and that is making us, I believe, the top exhibit in Salem in only a year and a half among, I think, over 50 exhibits. So it gives you an idea that really we're trying to do our best to present a quality, true-life historical exhibit in a location which has certainly had its share of witch kitsch over the years. Uh, so hopefully that's a good thing that, you know, there's basically just as much maritime history in Salem as there is witch history, and a lot of people don't know that. The first commercial port in the United States was actually Salem. So a lot of pirate goods came up to Salem, and a lot of pirates loved Salem, and that's one of the reasons why we're there. All righty? Okay. So what about this place? Uh, here's what it looks like. You can see this is the work that was done by a, a world-class crew that came in. This is a world-class exhibit that was designed by uh, National Geographic. And it traveled with National Geographic for about 10 years all around the world before it went into the archives. And we took it out and said, let's put more of these artifacts in circulation and show people the story. And so this swarm of people came in and actually restored this building. It's a beautiful building, and it's located right on this park, as I mentioned earlier. So if you're familiar with it, it looks a little bit like this, and it's on the back of the water, and that's Pickering Wharf that you see in the distance there, if anybody's ever been to Pickering Wharf. So what can I tell you about this? A lot. First of all, I'll give you just the primer about the museum. We're open all year round. We actually have... Um, a number of private events that we do, whether it's birthday parties or all kinds of, you know, um, groups just like we have here with Council on Aging, senior centers, schools, we can bring groups in. And the people come there, I think, because they really want to hear about real history. This is a place where you can talk and hear about real pirates. You can hear and see a real treasure. 
You're going to talk and hear about a real pirate ship. We have real artifacts that are coming up off the bottom of the seabed floor here right on Cape Cod every year for 41 years. <laughs> and we have a complimentary photo experience that people can have for their, um, their kids or their grandkids. Um, we have an audio track, and we also have docents that are fully trained on this particular story and on maritime history in Massachusetts and Salem. The museum itself is actually a really cool place, but I'm going to tell you first about the story that led us to build the museum. So, who is this ship, the Witta? First of all, has anybody ever heard about this story, the Witta Galley? You're familiar with it. Okay, how'd you hear about it? Yes, it was on Chronicle. That's right. Time ago, and that is basically off the page. Yep, that's exactly right. Um, maybe in the 80s, you might have read about it in the Boston Globe, in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the London Times. This thing hit the roadway, I'll tell you, as soon as Barry found the ship's bell here off the coast of Cape Cod. Up until that point, everybody was like, oh, yeah, Barry, you found a spoon, you know, you found coin, big deal. They could never correlate. They could never correlate the ship's treasure with the real ship. And then they did. And that was like the shot heard round the world. And from 1984 on, it was just a recovery effort. And it was an extremely visible recovery effort. And what you hear about at the museum is this recovery effort at the very end, but starting first with the story that led up to the ship's departure, etc. Now, let me give you the, the primer on the whole thing. The Witta was actually a slave ship. Like many ships of its time, it left England, commissioned by the King of England in 1715. The Bank of England financed this thing, and the infamous insurance company, Lloyd's of London, actually insured it. Right? Still around even to this day. And it was headed for the infamous Triangle Trade. It was leaving Europe, it was going to Africa, and it was picking up people where you know, the tribal uh, kingdom uh, would be negotiating with the European governments to actually put people on these big boats and move them to the Caribbean, in particular where things like tobacco and rum and sugar would be produced. And in many cases, those goods were making their way right up the eastern half of the United States. That's the origination point of the Witta, England, 1715. Now, this was also a very active commerce route, as you can imagine, back then. There were a lot of people that were uh, invested in it, like members of parliament. So it was pretty hard to shake this trade. i just just tell you that right now. And it was very, very lucrative. Meanwhile, back at the ranch in England, someone else is left penniless on the docks at age 26. His name was Sam Bellamy. And this is a real person. You can go to Google and Google Sam Bellamy. You're going to hear all about him. British naval sailor, age 26, stuck there without a career, almost loses his life, practically penniless because they didn't pay uh, sailors very well back then. And he's contemplating what's his next life going to be. And he's mad as heck at England. He says, you know what? Scorn you, England. I don't owe you anything anymore. I got to go find a new life for myself, in essence. I'm going to hop another ship, and I'm going to come to Cape Cod where I know that my relatives own a tavern out in the East M Orleans area known as Higgins Tavern. It's not there now. What does he do? He hops the ship, and he comes over. Now, remember, he's coming to Cape, and then the ship is already down in Africa migrating along. I should point out that the ship itself, Wida, W-H-Y-D-A-H, was named after the port in Africa where it went, Ouida. O-U-I-D-A-H, which is in today's modern-day country of Benin on the western half of Africa. That's where it was going. Now, uh, Bellamy heads all the way over to the Cape, and what happens to him? Of course, he falls in love. He finds the woman of his dreams, Maria Hallett. Has anybody ever gone to the Cape? <laughs> right. Okay. How many times have you passed a road or a funeral home or the soda found on Route 6A that's called the Hallett's? Bangs Hallett was a captain there, right? There's the Hallett's soda fountain over in Barnstable. There's Hallett's everywhere. I live off of Ansel Hallett Road. It's everywhere. The Hallett's were wealthy landowners down there at the time, and of course, they didn't know who Bellamy was, and he had no diary either, so they weren't too happy about him and Maria getting together. And he was faced with a dilemma. How do I get money for my girlfriend? And 
I've got to marry this woman. I want to get married, and I want to start a new life, maybe a society of my own that's better than the one I just left. This is what prompted a plan to be hatched. Working with somebody named uh, Paul's Grave Williams, who was a silversmith out of Providence, Rhode Island area, an older sailor than Bellamy, but a sailor nonetheless, the two of them get together and they realize that the hurricane fleet of 1715, the big Spanish galleons that just sank off the coast of Florida, may have left some things on the seabed floor. Why don't we go and see what we can find down there and maybe we can pick up a few coins and bring them back for Maria as a dowry. This is actually what started the journey, right? So a guy who's scorned by his own society, really, and his own government, coming here, trying to be enterprising, and trying to start his own life, and just to have a nice wife, and maybe a couple of coins, not so shabby. What's, what's wrong with that? So he and Paul's grave sail all the way down to Florida, and unfortunately they don't find anything. Spanish Navy, for the most part, standing guard over everything. So what do they do now? They continue down into the Caribbean. And Bellamy himself begins a journey into the ports around the Caribbean, making stops in different places where he realizes there's people that are just like him, impoverished sailors, the ex-slaves from the mines of Native America, the, the African slaves that have just come over to the Caribbean to do the work that we talked about earlier. And he says to himself, you know what, you guys are all in the same boat that I'm in. You have no future either. I'll tell you what, I know of a rule that allows you to vote your captain off of your ship if you don't like the way things are going on that ship. It is, after all, a democratic vote. And if you would like, take that ship over and I will give you an equal share of whatever I recover as long as you follow my rules, the infamous ship's articles or code of conduct. That's how this whole thing begins. Now, if you're a slave, you certainly would hop the ship and go with him. You have nothing to lose. And when I say nothing to lose, take a look at this. Over here on the right, you see some things that look like bronze. Does anybody know what these are? You'd think they were. They look like handcuffs. They might as well be. They are the currency of the slave trade, one of few. These are called manila bracelets. Ten of those bracelets worn on your arm would buy you a human being. And those are what we're recovering off the ship. So you really can see, oh my gosh, no wonder why these people were doing what they were doing, right? This wasn't nice. And we tell this even to the school kids that come into the museum because we want them to understand this is a part of our heritage, <laughs> our lives that we don't want to repeat. And they understand that. They study that in school. So it's really enlightening for them, and they kind of link and label what they learn in school to real-life history here. Yeah, it is amazing. and We keep that in our minds all the time when we're there. Now, what happens when they go on the journey is they start walking around and, well, I should say sailing around and seeing many different ships and ports. And the next thing you know, they're collecting quite a crew. They're doing things like eating well. They have utensils. Now, is that really incredible jewels? Not really. But as you can see, for them, that was a big deal. They barely had the shoes on their feet. Here they ate. They could actually live a decent life. And this prompts us to think in the museum about the fact that, you know, why did the pirates do what they did? You know, our modern day view of pirates is Johnny Depp and a lot of eye makeup and swashbuckling. That's our view. When you ask the kids, do you know what a pirate is? They'll say, Johnny Depp. You know, yes and no. Yes, because some dressed very ornately with things like what you'll see in the museum, belt buckles and shapes and you know, beautiful studded cufflinks, because they were taking these because they had no idea what they were, and they were living a big, grandiose life to them. So the reality is, and the theory that we teach here, which is from a, a historian named Marcus Redeker, actually, who follows the same type of history pattern, who wrote a book called History from the Bottoms Up, the story here is about the impoverished people who became pirates because they really didn't have much going for them at the time. And that's what we talk about here in the museum. So, what happens? Well, here we are in the journey. Now he's starting to pick up some... He's got 140 people. Now, some of them include John Julian here, a Native American, only 16 years old. And he was the pilot on the ship, so he'd be the kid that guided the ship into port in the storms. Now imagine a 16-year-old kid today <laughs> with a responsible <laughs> job like that, right? That's pretty cool. Here we are, Hendrik Quinter, a Dutch-African slave, 
also on the ship. There's Maria, there's Sam, and also a little boy named John King, and I'll talk about John King in just a second. This is some of the cast of characters. Now, they go on this journey at this point collecting 140 men. In one year, Sam Bellamy amassed the goods with these people, all in the name of being like the Robin Hood of men that would equate to such a large fortune that even today in the year 2023, Sam Bellamy, as he was known, Black Sam Bellamy, for his long flowing hair that he never tied back in the right format, is the richest pirate ever on the Forbes list of the world's richest pirates. And yes, there is a Forbes <laughs> list of the world's <laughs> richest pirates, which I never knew until I got into piracy. But there is. And even today, he is still on that top of the list. So that gives you an idea of how massive this, uh, this treasure gathering was. So one of the things that's kind of cool about this story is, what about her? She was not on the ship. She's left behind. Another interesting thing that happens in this museum, which we talk about, it moves lore to to legend, actually. And that has to do with this little piece that's over on the right-hand side. So here's Maria. They want to get married. She's left behind. And the question is, whatever happens to her? Now, we don't know a lot about Maria, to be honest with you. Down in the Cape, we've scoured just about every graveyard. We've done all the research. Much of the research was done by Kenneth Kinkor, who was Barry Clifford's uh, really expert researcher in this area and really best known. Uh, in fact, to a point where most of the TV documentaries that you see around the world uh, usually quote Ken uh, as because he had so much uh, knowledge about this area. And he did a lot of work to try to recover uh, Maria, as does the dive team even to this day. They're still looking around in Freshbrook down in Wellfleet or out on Provincetown or on the beaches to see if they can find any evidence of maybe Maria or others. By all accounts, Maria was only about 16 when they met. And she was a lovely girl. She had hair the color of corn silk, as the primary source, source ar archives talk about. And she had blue eyes, the colors, the deep of Gull Pond, as the archives said. But did she remarry? Did she have other children? What happened to Maria? We don't really know. But the one thing we do know is this. Back in the 1930s, a woman here locally named Elizabeth Reynard wrote a book. She actually wrote two books. Uh, one was called The Narrow Lands, and the other one was called The Mutinous Winds. You can still find these books in the sort of aftermarket down on the Cape or perhaps elsewhere on Amazon or the Internet. Elizabeth was known for writing about piracy and folkloric on the Cape. So what does she do? She interviews members of the Hallett family. What else do you do when people are gone, right? You interview the relatives to find out what happened to these people. And she says to them, what do you remember about Sam and Maria? And 200 and some odd la years later, they say, well, you know, we don't remember that much about them. But what we do recall is we were always told that when Sam left for Florida to find a fortune for Maria, he was given by her a teapot and a ribbon with ruby rose and thistle on it. That's what the research tells us. Honestly, you couldn't, pe you couldn't peg this. In the lab down on Cape, we have a black teapot that's this high. And we have a ribbon that's wrapped around a pistol that is the most elaborate pistol that we have. And it's called the Sun King pistol because it has a beautiful silver emblem on it, a beautiful silver escutcheon. And presumably it was belonging to somebody that was of importance on the ship, most notably Bellamy. Wrapped around it was this gorgeous ribbon. That ribbon is that ribbon. That is the ruby rose and thistle ribbon. And it's there in Salem where you can see it. So putting 300 years of history together, the legend is really here in Massachusetts, which is kind of cool. And that's the type of things that, again, link and label the history to what people's past experiences have been in their lives. Of course, everybody wants to know about what else did they find when they were down there. <laughs> Now remember, Bellamy at this point is taking up all of these things, this whole thing off of 52 other ships. He's heading up from Jamaica, which was the last port, and he's going to bring all this back up to Maria. Interestingly enough, he actually, um, when he left, he was stopping in Jamaica, which was the last port where the slaves were actually dropped off. And a little boy named John King was there on the docks and saw the ship in the port. 
John was an English boy, and he had his parents with him. If you call that picture early, we talked about this little boy. John said to his parents, Mom and Dad, I want to go onto the ship. I want to be a pirate. And of course, the mother and father said, John, you can't go. You're a little kid. Of course, as all little kids do, doesn't he hop the ship and go? And that's what we hear, right, from the primary source research. Well, to be honest with you, in the Cape, at Barry's lab, we have the stocking, the shoe, and the leg bone of a 9 to 10-year-old boy. So we're pretty sure that was John King, and that also debunks the mystery about whether or not he really was in the ship. Cool stuff. Also in the ship was all these coins. Now, you might ask a question. In fact, a few of you were asking the question earlier about, well, how did they find this thing? <laughs> I mean, what the heck? Well, in 1984, Barry was doing a lot of and he's looking, looking, looking. He's thinking, he's dreaming about the ship that Uncle Bull told him about. And he really wants to go after this thing. Well, who happens to show up at his friend Tom Styron's house in Martha's Vineyard one day, but none other than the news anchor, Walter Cronkite. Everybody remember him? Yes. So Walter says to Barry, what are you doing brooding in the corner over there, Barry? What's the deal? And Barry says, well, you know, my uncle told me about this shipwreck, and I'm 30 years old. I'm trying to see if I can find it, ba-ba-ba. And Walter Cronkite says, Barry, you got to get out there. Follow your dream. Do what you got to do to recover this thing. It sounds really important. He picks up the phone and he calls, ironically, another famous person and says, pack your bags. You're coming back to Cape Cod. You're going to actually dive on a called the Witta. Guy named Barry Clifford. Get back here right away. Who is that person? None other than the infamous John John Kennedy. John John Kennedy dove this shipwreck for, I think, about five years. In fact, we found his compass years later, uh, 20 years after he was diving, and it dropped down into one of the pits down there. And they, they found it, and they put it in the lab down in the Cape. Honestly, it's the most valuable artifact we have. <laughs> the gold and the silver pale in comparison to John John Kennedy's compass. But, you know, the name carries a lot of weight, especially here in Massachusetts, right? It's really fascinating. So that's how he actually got into the whole dive shop situation. But how did he actually find the treasure? Well, this is really cool. Back in that time period, so this is 1717 or so, the governor of Massachusetts at the time was a guy named Samuel Shute, S-H-U-T-E. The ship comes into port, actually doesn't even make it to port. It's off the coast of Cape Cod. That's kind of where we get to next, this whole story. And the ship actually gets all the way up here with a full slate of guys on it, all the treasure, 50-pound uh, bags equally shared between each person. And they get only 1,500 feet offshore. And what happens? A nor'easter takes them down. Yeah, they sink big. This, this mast snaps and the ship sinks. Now, there's a flotilla of three or four other ships out distance there. They managed to do okay, but the wit is too far inland, and it's so heavy at this point, just top heavy like this, you can imagine, with all that stuff on it and all the people, that it breaks up and it sinks. Well, I know, that's the really the demise of the whole story, and it's kind of sad when you think about it, because here's Bellamy. He's made it all the way down, changed his life. He's going to come back with his dowry. He's going to start his new democratic egalitarian society with these wonderful people, and he almost makes it but then he has tragedy that sets in, so it's kind of sad. But this is what the cool story is that leads us to how Barry and Brandon discovered this thing. So in the archives, of course, they're studying, studying, studying all over, and all over Massachusetts, into Europe, trying to find out where did this ship go and what happened to it. In the archives in Harvard University here, the map archives right in Cambridge, Barry's milling around one day and he sees some maps and he reads something in the maps, and then he puts it all together. The governor at the time, when he finds out the ship sinks, sends his top cartographer down to the Cape. His name was Cyprian Southack at the time. Cyprian, of course, he's an expert map maker, right? So he can draw in precise detail everything that's occurring. And of course, there's bodies all over the beach. There's everywhere. Who knows what else is down there? So he sends Cyprian down. He says, Cyprian, get down there. Find out what's going on? Document everything. Presumably the state of Massachusetts might even be entitled to a share of whatever they're recovering there. Cyprian goes all the way down and he sees some natives out there. 
natives, a couple of farmers in the dunes in East Ham or whatever. And it's not a lot of population in the Cape in the 1700s, as you can imagine, and just a few dirt roads. And he says, what did you guys see? What did you guys see? And of course, these people are all, interestingly enough, they're saying to uh, we didn't see anything, <laughs> not a thing. <laughs> That's what the archives tell us, right? But the reality of it is, most likely, there's some people that waited in the door, sewn on the inside, knocked on someone's door, gave them a gold piece, and said, you never saw me. And that's probably more than likely what could have happened. And in fact, many of us could be related to pirates by now. They might have disappeared <laughs> into the hinterlands. Because at that point, they probably would have been tried as pirates anyway. So all of a sudden, what was the most fascinating thing of all is in the archives, a statement made by Cyprian Southeck reporting back to Governor Shute here in Massachusetts at the State House. Governor, they're telling me that the riches with the guns will be buried in the sand. The riches with the guns will be buried in the sand. Well, Barry's like, I know what happened. Now I know why no one's been able to find this thing. What happens when this 80 gajillion ton ship comes into the coast, right, and is so top heavy, it topsides, goes bottoms up, and all this is going right into the sand. And that's exactly what happened. The widow left England with 18 cannon and eight guns on it. I think it was 26 guns. Right now, down in the lab, including the three cannon we have at Real Pirate Salem, we have over 60 cannon that have been pulled up off the Cape. And that's because these guys were amassing the guns. And the presumption is that they were going to go up off of the coast of Maine or Nova Scotia and probably start their own democratic society, scorning everyone else. And unfortunately, they never got there. That's how Barry was able to actually find the treasure and the stuff that come up the ship. He was going down below the Samsung, 10 to 20, maybe even 30 feet, depending on where they were. And that is very difficult to find, as you can imagine. First of all, you had to be extraordinarily fit to do this work. Uh, Barry himself, I think, does 300 sit-ups a day and bikes 60 miles all over the place in the Cape. And his son is equally as athletic. And you also need to have great technology. They use something they call a deflector right now, which is essentially a shield that just redirects the propulsion off the engines of Barry's boat now to go down into the sand and blow a little hole. And you have to do this and be very correct in terms of the environment, right? Because you don't want to disturb the Cape's seabed floor too much. And all this has been done in an award-winning fashion, really. So they have really done a great job finding and also preserve it in, in accordance with all the rules of the proper preservation of these things. And that's an example of what they're finding. Now, today, but I'm going to bring you some pieces that you're going to be surprised to see. These are what they're finding. Pieces of eight. Solid sterling silver. I'm going to give these to you guys, and I'm going to watch everyone's pockets. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to collect two before I leave here for killing <laughs> Now, I cannot, for insurance purposes, give you the widow's coins, but I am giving you a ship of the same era in the same area. So what you're seeing is as good as what the widow's coins are, and they are heavy. Those are solid sterling. Most of the time, the coins were minted in Mexico and Bolivia. The silver itself was mined in the hills of Mexico, trekked down by goats and uh, donkeys into eventually Bolivia. And in fact, the mine in Bolivia and Potosi, where these coins in many cases were uh, minted, is still in existence. We had some people uh, in the museum a couple weeks ago from Bolivia, and they told us this. They said, you know, this mine is, there's people living alongside the river now. And they said the river was purple now, but <laughs> they said that the mine is still in operation. So pretty cool. Even the, the old, many years ago, is actually the new. Even today, it's still happening. So these are some of the coins with the pieces of eight. Um, a lot of people don't know what a piece of eight is, so I put this up here to show you. You, you, know, you use the term piece of eight all the time, but what was a piece of eight? Well, back then, you didn't just walk into the grocery store, right, with you know, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter. You had to cut and weigh the silver. And that's what a piece of eight was. Eight real, four real, two, one and one half. In fact, these little guys here, this, as a matter of fact, I have one of these, I think. It's called a cob. And you can see it's so small, and it's still concreted. We call this a concretion because this is what happens when it comes up off the bottom of the ocean. There's iron ore and all the ferrous minerals interacting in the water that creates this coral-like shell around these things. 
And that's what an underwater conservator does. They take these things off of the artifacts. Well, these are so small that the conservator says you really don't even want to touch them because they'll just crumble in many cases. So you don't want to destroy them, and that's why we keep them in their state. Now, you also see some other things here. Uh, from this is the rigging of the ship. Uh, and this is so cool because we have a demo of this. When you walk, through, you walk through the museum, you actually walk onto a ship, and that's the dead eye as you see it. That's what would have attached the sails to the ship itself. In its concreted stage, it looks like that when it first comes up from the bottom of the ocean. But when it's fully taken apart, this is what it looks like, and you can see it in the museum. Some of the huge ropes, those ropes are this big. Um, there's other pieces here, some of the carpentry, etc. And that's uh, sort of the beauty of seeing everything from when it was to what it is now. And what you also see here is the gifts. <laughs> and a lot of the gifts have things that are actually recreations of what I'm going to show you right now. What do you think this is? Cannonball. This is a cannonball. Um, I'm going to just let you see it for a minute, but I, I have to be careful so you don't drop wow, it on your foot. It's heavy. Right? Heavy. Yeah. I don't want to have a liability claim in here. No. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Oh, my goodness. So the, sh wow. the pound shot that we have in the museum oh, goes up okay. to six pounds. Wow. Yeah, it's a French cannon. <laughs> it's heavy, right? Very wow. heavy. Yeah. Now, it didn't go too far, but it was enough to put the, a hole in the sails and slow the ships down. Now, Bellamy was never known to kill or hurt anybody. That's his real claim to fame. That's what made him the Robin Hood of men, as they said. He was always interested mostly in just trying to get a, whoa, just trying to get a treasure. Isn't that neat? What's that, hon? How big is it? Six, oh, how heavy? Six pounds. <laughs> I'll let you all see it. So this is what you see when you come to the museum. People are actually seeing the real stuff, right? Very fascinating. And when you see artifacts like this, you realize this is, it comes to life, you know? These guys had no future. They were doing whatever they could. That's what they were doing to try to evade what was their destiny. Yes, it does. <laughs> but it's not dangerous. Isn't that cool? Yes, it does. Uh, it's heavy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Now, I'm going to bring this back up here, and I'm going to give everyone the chance to touch it, but I'm going to continue on here a little bit. These are the fishing weights that they used to fish with. Look at these. They're small, right? But what would you do on the ship if you're hanging out there with, a, you know, hours and hours ahead of you? Now, on the, on the ship's articles, they had very basic things to signed off on. Like you won't, you lights out at nine, you won't gamble on the ship. Actually, very basic things. It wasn't that bad. And one of the things, of course, that they could do is fish. They couldn't gamble, but they actually could play games. And in the museum, we actually have gaming tokens. It's very cool to see that. Um, copper nail here, kind of interesting. And this actually comes from another shipwreck that's very similar here off the coast of Florida. And I'm showing it to you because, as you can see, this is a hook. This is what happens when they find these things. This is from the state of Florida. This one actually tags it so you know exactly where it, where it is and what it's tied to. Interestingly enough, in these areas, because they're afraid that people will steal everything and ruin the, right, ruin the history, that they usually identify these wrecks in some benign form. That one is tied to a shipwreck called Cabin Wreck. That's all it's called, because they don't want anybody to know what ship it comes off of. Uh, that was a hook. That was a big hook that would have been hung probably to lift something like a platform with a pulley. Isn't that cool? So these are just some of the more you know uninteresting artifacts that are coming up. But and as I mentioned, I, I want to be clear, these are not the Wittes coins because I can't circulate the Wittes coins. They're priceless. And actually, none of you probably have seen a Wittes coin because they're not in the marketplace. 
<clears throat> Every once in a while, you can see one sneak out to auction. I remember a long time ago, Barry telling me a story about how a woman approached him down in the Cape and said she had a bracelet on, and it was full of coins. And she said, my grandfather said that these coins came from the shipwreck Widda. And, you know, I remember him saying to me, you know, lady, you better put those in a vault because they really are worth so much money because they aren't a circulated coin. Yes? Yep? Yeah, usually what would happen is, remember, piracy was pretty rampant back then. And nobody really wanted to lose their lives. So what would usually happen is when they would approach a ship, the captain ahead of them knew that he wouldn't lose their life if he just dropped the flag and let them board. So he, in many cases, would negotiate his way with that captain. In many cases, he traded the ships. In fact, the widow itself, he gave chase for the widow for three days to track it down from Captain Prince, who had it before him. And he just knew that this ship was going to be very valuable, so he chased it. Captain Prince conceded. He gave Prince the uh, ship that he was on, and he took the widow, and off it went. I didn't comment on this, by the way. The widow was a galley. And the reason why it was such a valuable ship was because you could row it into a port, or you could sail it in open ocean. So unfortunately, none of that helped it in the Cape, <laughs> where it just, just wrecked right offshore. But uh, that's really what it's, what it, uh, why it was so valuable. You had a second question. Eight real, eight real was real, the Spanish real. Right, and these other ones that I showed you earlier were cut down to four reals, two, one, one half. Yep. Yes? Yes, they were. And they got quite pitted from being under the water, but I'm not so sure they weren't pitted to begin with. You know, it's kind of hard to tell. One of the things that's sort of interesting is that you see, for example, that ribbon. Now, how does a ribbon survive 307 years underwater, right? Well, once it gets down below that artifact layer in the sand, most everything that you're seeing is found 10 to 20 to 30 feet below sand. So the oxygen content is a lot different. It's right down to like the glacial till, the Pleistocene clay cobble layers where the stuff is. In fact, if you watch that show that I was talking about earlier, Beyond Oak Island, uh, in episode three, uh, sorry, episode 11, they ta ba uh, Brandon talks about this. He says that... Uh, there's a layer of very powdery white sand that gets down that far. It's like Bermudian sand, which you know, <coughs> if you've ever been on a beach in Massachusetts, we do not have Bermudian sand here. <laughs> but when you get down to that layer, that glacial till layer, it's like powdery white fine sand. And he said, that's how I know I'm at the artifact layer. So it's a chore. And Mel Fisher, who discovered the Atocha, right, he lost, I think, family members over it and was sued by the state of Florida and all kinds of things. It takes a lot of hard work and gumption, really, honestly. Half crazy sometimes, I think, to be able to find stuff like this. You know, where these boats leave to discover the artifacts today are in an unrecognized Coast Guard port here on the Cape. And there's a breakwater there. On a bad day, the boats easily could go 10 feet up in the air and come crashing down. Some of them have even flipped through history. So, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. And that's why I say that uh, my business partners and I feel strongly about helping these guys because on the one hand, it's really valuable that they found it, but on the other hand, we don't want them to sell it or it will ruin the story because in the end, the real treasure here, as you can see, is not the gold and the silver. Uh, it's the story. Yeah. That's a very interesting question. A lot of people ask that question. And uh, when the ship was discovered, there weren't a lot of laws actually about this uh, abandoned property, you know. And that's one of the things that Barry and his attorneys, who are local men here, still in existence, who actually set the records, really, for how to keep these things intact. Uh, and those really, basically the general rule of this, and you can actually Google this on the internet and see this, the history of the court cases and everything. The general hypothesis here and the rule is that if you were to gather everything up from the shipwreck and then you could sell it, the state where it originated in here, Massachusetts, would be entitled to a portion of it. 
But you can imagine we're only 20% recovered after 41 years on this thing. So you can imagine how long it will take to recover 100% of the shipwreck. And we know this from the primary source research and the documentation that says every min shares stored equally in bags at the mid-layer, blah, 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 blah. So we know we're far behind the collection of it. That's how it will work today. And one of the best things about the museum, as is the museum at the Cape, is that the Cliffords have no intention of selling anything. Their goal is to preserve this so our kids and our kids' kids will be able to see this very same story in history for the rest of their lives. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. A portion of what we earn is actually going right back to the dive operation to accelerate the recovery effort of the shipwreck. That's our goal. And even now, a secondary goal here is more important. We have a mission of the museum, which is to inspire the bold explorer in all of us. And that mission was never more clear than one day when a little boy who's 10 years old came in from Connecticut with his mom and dad and his brother last fall. So they saw the museum. They were enamored by what they saw. They left. They went camping on Winter Island up by Salem Willows, if you know where that is, the beach. Two days later or so, they came back into the museum. And the kid was beaming. Matthew was his name. He's coming in like this with this big, huge thing. And he says with his eyes wide open, I found a concretion. We're like, wow, holy mackerel, you really did. Where did you find it? I found it here camping in Salem. Okay, so what do we do? We contact the conservator and we say, can you do us a favor? Can you take a look at this thing and see what it is? We have no idea what it is. Sure, absolutely for the little boy would do it. Ship this thing down in Florida. The guy works on it. And it turns out to be a ship spike uh, from a ship that was in the Salem-Beverly area that was quite old. And he was excited that this had happened. But we didn't just take it to there. What my partner said is, is, you know, we should do more to talk about this with the kids in the school, and maybe this will motivate others like Matthew. We gave him a scholarship to his school for $1,000. And then on top of that, we brought him into uh, a meeting that we had with the Chamber of Commerce and all, all the local S Salem businesses, and we gave him a certificate, and he got a standing ovation and the whole thing. And that was no better example of inspiring the bold explorer in all of us. So our goal in the museum, as you can see, is to share the story, not just the kitsch, <laughs> but to share the story about the widow so that you can become your own bold explorer in your life. You'll do the things that these sailors did. You won't be afraid to take a boat ride someday. You might find something on a beach that you might like to explore further. And your children might need to learn the same thing about history and life. And I think of all those things, those are some of the most important lessons that the museum and the artifacts teach us. Um, so that is sort of the formal end of the presentation I'm giving you right now. Um, what I'd like to do is, again, open it up for any questions that you have about the shipwreck. Monthly, was it most of the all monthly? That's right. Monthly, like spread over like five miles? Yeah, right, it's a good thing you said that. Right now, the Witta, it sank not more than 1,500 feet offshore. It was really close. You can imagine Maria in the distance and the whole thing. Yeah, On the Outer Cape. Yep, right off the coast of the National Seashore. But right now, it's spread out over a four to seven mile radius. And that's four to seven miles. Oh, it's just it's all, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It was five miles. Now it's mm -hmm. now yeah, miles. depending on That's the year. year. Right, it was. And it not only. And by the way, I noticed your. Uh, did you get this from uh, the Cape? From the Provincetown Museum. Back sure. Back. Yep. Twenty something. This is twenty something. That's the original museum that Barry had. Love it. Thank you, you for bringing it. <laughs> 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 they all are for all of us. <laughs> That's an awesome shirt. Yes, and I will tell you right now, with the hurricanes, like this weekend, you know, it's just going to move it around. And what they do, you know, is they really try to, every year they try to go out in the spring, they survey where everything is and how did the, the topography of the ocean change, and then they focus in another area. Those manilas that I showed you earlier were actually dumped, like somebody just dumped a barrel on the seabed floor. It was really amazing. The only things that were above the sand that they've ever found. Yes? Probably when someone finds a shipwreck, do they have a hold on it, or can anyone work on it at the same time? That's a good question, too. You know, uh, there's a lot of questions about that. You, first of all, it is a permitted shipwreck site, so you have to apply for the permits every year or so. I'm not sure of the exact cadence, but you have to apply. And over 40 years, these guys have maintained those permits. 
Second of all, it's really hard to dive this thing. <laughs> so even if you wanted to, you'd really have a tough time finding anything. And you need the right equipment, precise GPS positioning tools. And not only that, but you know, whammy number three is the fact that the Park Service and the Coast Guard down there, uh, they know everything about what's happening with this wreck site. And they keep an eye on it because they want the same thing to happen. They want the preservation sure. you know, to occur. So this is a good question. Yes? Turn it in or restore it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And right here, you know, you really, it's hard to prevent people. You know, people steal. In fact, even in Br Barry's books, he's got a few books on the market um, that talk about what he went through as a person with this thing. And you really get an appreciation of what he went through. Now, he was a football player at uh, Whitman Hanson High School. And he was a diver. You know, he used to repair Barry down in the Cape, a uh, high-risk diver. And I wouldn't say that he had as much, you know, business training as a person, right, in his life. So when people would, uh, you know, come to him and, you know, go after him, and there were a lot of people that did in the early days. They said, you're going to steal all this stuff. You're going to sell it. You're going to wreck the treasure. In fact, even where we are in Salem, in Salem State University, the most wonderful professors that we work with there now, they teach their classes so it's such a great testimonial for him to know that years later, 40 years later, it's all sitting in the vaults. We're working hard to unveil it all and to keep it preserved. And that's the goal, you know? So if you do find these things on the beach, turn them in. <laughs> yes? Well, only 1,500 feet. Little, you could swim it. And in fact, eight guys did, by the way. I never told you that part of the story. Uh, six people off of the flotilla of other ships that were in there, and then two that were off of the widow. The eight were in the jailhouse in uh, Boston for, um, from April to October, and they were tried in Boston in October. Uh, six of them were tried and hung. The other two, yeah, the other two were not. Hung for piracy. Yeah. No, it was a great question, and I want to tell you a little bit more about that, too. The two people that were actually freed were, first of all, Thomas Davis, who was the carpenter on the ship. They claimed that he was being taken against his will for his skill set, so he was freed. The other person was John Julian, the 16-year-old Native American, the Mosquito Indian, because you'd never hang in a Mosquito Indian. However, what happens to him? Years later, he's still in the employ in Boston with John Quincy Adams' great-grandfather. They gave him to him, or sold him. Yeah, so he didn't really end up any better either, but uh, I think he ran away. I think he might have been into trouble and things, but in the end, that's where they all landed. The one thing I didn't tell you about was actually quite a sad part of this story, which, again, we look to validate as much as we can in the research. Maria Hallett, we, as I mentioned, don't know much about her, but one thing that we understand may have occurred is that she may have actually had a baby by Sam Bellamy, which we're not even sure if he knew about before he left. And unfortunately, then you wouldn't have children out of wedlock, and he was hidden in a barn down in the Cape. And supposedly he uh, didn't survive, and she was the only relative left behind, and they branded her a murderess and supposedly put her in jail down in the jailhouse. So uh, the sad part about this is yet another reason why we're in Salem is because in the Truro jailhouse, the jailer felt so bad for her that he would let her out at night to walk the dunes. And the people down there would say, oh, don't go near her. She's a witch, the witch of Wellfleet. She's walking in the dunes at night, presumably looking for him. Uh, so she was branded a witch, which is another woman persecuted yet in the puritanical society for her actions like the other witches of Salem were. The other thing that's interesting about the tie to Salem is that Cotton Mather, the infamous preacher in the pulpit in the witch trials, trying to grandstand and make a name for himself, he actually appears in the pirate trials. He hears about the pirate trials and trots down to Boston in his coach and stands in the pulpit at the pirate trials and preaches the evils of piracy as well. So we have several ties to Salem, one of the reasons why we are situated with this museum in Salem. Not exactly happy endings for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly.
Yes, actually, it's a good question. Um, well, some of the things like what I just showed you earlier are actually part like where that um, dead eye was. It's actually attached to the ship. But they have found to the ship. We have found um, a very big part of the ship that they are, it's still down there right now, and they're working on it. They call it the cannon pile because there's a whole bunch of cannons also in that area. And so that's uh, underway right now. One of the things that I think is the most interesting part of the whole museum, and maybe the most sobering, speaking of sad stories here, uh, is in a big tank in the back of the museum. <coughs> and in fact, if anybody was watching Channel 4 about February time frame, we unveiled the world's only pirate's rifle that's ever been found, and it's here in Salem, sitting in the electrolysis bath right now. Very, very cool. And what's significant about this is um, this thing's coming out of that rifle all the time off the electrolysis, which is gently shaking the concreted material off of it. Musket balls, um, some coins. Uh, also, gold dust is actually uh, was part of the cargo of the world. So even when we take things off of the concretions, we don't throw it away. It's sitting in bags all tagged because at some point there'll probably be a big centrifuge party and there's all this gold dust that will come out of all of these artifacts. But the most important part of the thing that was in the tank isn't actually tied to the uh, rifle. It's actually something that came up from the Cape that one of the conservators there sent to the conservator up in Salem because he wasn't sure how to treat it. And it is two slats of wood, the inside of the ship, and they're tied with a rope, like a hemp rope around them on both ends of it. Now, to the naked eye, you'd say, okay, well, that's just part of the inside of the ship. What the conservator said to me is, no, not really. That rope is where they tied the people to the boat. So you look at that and you say, it becomes reality to you, and you say, oh my God, you know. No wonder these people did what they did. How would you like to have that life? The average age of a pirate was 37 years old. So, you know, no wonder why they did what they did. They just wanted a, they wanted a better life for themselves, and this was their way of rebelling, really. And it certainly was a little bit more of a benign way to rebel, believe it or not, than the way we see people rebelling today. But in reality, that was how they why they did it. Fascinating, right? It fascinating. Yep. Were yeah. Why were they hung? They went to the boat. Yep. They were tried for piracy because at this oh, point they, everything washed ashore they and they saw all the coins. <coughs> they while well, they were taking the things at that point and of course the legend here is that nobody they were still taking ships even though they were sort of uh, friendly takings, if you will, right? At that time, it was better than the privateers coming after you or, you know, the British Navy or whatever. So they kind of just had this sort of thing that would happen between the different ships. But they would have been carrying material that would have been pirate material. Wow. Yeah. And it's still down there. So if anybody has a good scuba, <laughs> scuba <laughs> so you can try it. But the most important thing right now is that we have these gigantic great whites that are in the area that you probably have heard. <laughs> and that's really not a great thing. Um, the guys are fine with it, but it is a little frightening if you're a diver. So um, <clears throat> we have different technology now, beacons that are coming from Australia, drones that are helping the dive operation. And we even have helped the swimmers in that area who, when they're out there, our divers alert the Coast Guard and the National Park Service to bring them in. So it's actually very collaborative at this point, 40 years later. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Uh, you mentioned earlier, you, <coughs> you say that you found 60 guns? Yeah. Now when you mean guns, <coughs> do you mean pieces of... Cannon, mostly cannon, no, 60 cannon. 60 cannon? Mm-hmm. Yeah, think about it. It's 12 to 1,500 pounds each. So you figure, no wonder why the thing taps, capsized, right? It, I mean, it's just wobbling out there, full of all this stuff, right? 60, 60 cannon. cannon. And there's more. The cannon pile I was telling you about is sitting off the bottom of the ocean right now. Well, no wonder they didn't negotiate the other people to go to you. I mean, <laughs> it's old Black Sam was going to be named that because of his hair. His hair. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. He was. He was known to never hurt or kill anybody. That's what I was saying earlier. And he was that way. He was known as this Robin Hood guy because the reality, think about it. He's amassing all these goods thinking that those goods were being paid for with the money that were, was coming from the slaves. So as far as he was concerned, he was giving it back. And in fact, in the museum, we have a soliloquy of Bellamy that you hear when you walk through Bellamy's cabin. And it's him basically giving guff to another captain who's giving him guff back. And it's a famous speech that you can actually find on the Internet. And what he's basically saying is, you know, you're, you're telling me I'm a problem. 
one that ri robs from the rich to give back to the poor. You guys are the ones that. So that's how he envisioned himself. And when he left and came back up here, his goal, we think, was to start his own egalitarian society somewhere else because he was sick of it. Yeah. And they say, yeah, if you could take a ship, why not? Yeah. Well, you could also get killed. That's right, you could. Yeah. There were a lot of pirates yeah. like that. Yeah, there were a lot of rawest pirates. In fact, if you get wounded, it was a death sentence. So yep. if you had 140 men, if you negotiate, you keep 140 men. Yep. Take half of yeah. whatever they wanted to give you. And if you didn't, then you might come back with only 100 men. Exactly, exactly. So I, I didn't know that until I read about that. <coughs> No, which was him. When you actually go to the museum, you'll find some books about piracy that you'll really like. And um, I forgot to remind you, this is the address of the museum if you want to go. Um, and you can buy the tickets online, by the way. No, he's across the street. That's the New England Pirate Museum. You're right. And that's a little museum more kid-focused, and that's on Derby Street a little further down. This museum is a really big museum. And that's across the street on the park. So when you go, don't con yeah, we're two separate. Don't confuse them. But we collaboratively share because we all talk about stories of piracy anyway. And as I say, we are all about building the piracy uh, and maritime history in Salem as much as we are the witch history, which I hope people are learning a lot about. Yeah. You know the length of the witch? 180 feet, I think it was. 182. Wow. Don't quote me on that, but yeah, it was a big ship. Canada. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Well, I studied a lot with Brandon and Barry, who really, when you feel so engaged by the subject matter, you learn. And my business partners are even better at really recapping the historical components. But what, hopefully what you take away from this is the real storyline behind why the ship was in existence and why it sunk and why it's important to Massachusetts history. You know, it's right here. If you go down to the National Seashore, they actually have a little museum there. They talk about the widow. You can see the Truro Jailhouse where Maria carved a, you know, a picture of a sailboat in there. It's pretty cool. And I encourage you to go down there and look at it and, of course, to come to Salem whenever you can. Um, now, before I finish, who's got the two coins? <laughs> ah, hi, I got one. Where's the other one? I'm, I'm telling you, who's got the other coin? <coughs> I see one. <laughs> Whoops, but I don't see the other one. Did the other one come up? The other one. Oh, you've got them both. Okay, great. I'm checking to make sure we don't have any pirates in the area. Yeah, let me check. Sure. Did anybody take a chunk off them? Let me check. <laughs> uh, one more question. Yes. Four to seven. Four to seven. Yes, totally. And in fact, we look at this, you know, this hurricane coming up, if that could make a mess of things, too. And if you watch the show um, in Beyond Oak Island, you'll see there were eight anchor on that ship that was on the show at that particular time, and the ship blew off the anchor. And it was a, not a bad day, either. So you can, and it's not even that far off shore. It's just such a miserable place. Yeah. <laughs> really bad. So a tough diving conditions. All right. With that said, I'm at the top of the hour. Thank you, guys. Come visit us. Thank you very much. I'm glad to have a nice entertaining audience, too, that didn't steal. <laughs>